Welcome to Too Fond of Books. I'm Janelle and this is the second day of March Mystery Madness. How's it going? Have you been reading tons and tons of mysteries? I know it's only the second day, but I'm just so excited. Today I will be reviewing Death in the Clouds by Agatha Christie. I just finished this book and I love Agatha Christie and I have never read Death in the Clouds before, so I'm excited to talk about it. But first, it's time to reveal the answer to yesterday's My March Mystery Madness Mind Bender. And the clue was, this famous detective solved mysteries in Yugoslavia, Iraq, Jordan, Egypt, and France. And the answer is Hercule Poirot, of course, Agatha Christie. So he solved mysteries in Yugoslavia, in Her on the Orient Express, in Iraq, in Murder in Mesopotamia, in Jordan, in Death by, Death, I always want to call it Death by Appointment, but it is Appointment with Death in Egypt in Death on the Nile and this is a great movie cover version uh, of the movie from the 70s with Peter Ustinoff and Betty Davis and Mia Farrow and Maggie Smith and um, Angela Lansbury. It's a great movie. Check it out if you've never seen it. Anyway, Death on the Nile and in France in Murder on the Lakes. So stay tuned uh, to the end of this video for the next My March Mystery Madness Mind Bender. But for now, let's get into Death in the Clouds. Now, I'll re be referring to my notebook. I have a um, special Agatha Christie notebook where I keep notes about her books. Now, I've been doing a reread or a read through of Agatha Christie. Um, in chronological order, in, in published order, um, because I'm so curious to see her development as a writer and uh, some of the things that you can notice when you read through um, books that are written in books, read through books uh, in published order. Uh, and so one thing that I've really been noticing as I've been doing this read is becoming aware of is the universe of Agatha Christie. And I'm really starting to pick up on the fact that all of her books, no matter what her main character are, wh whether they are Poirot's or Marple's or Quinn's or Tommy and Tuppence, maybe, we'll see, but they all seem to be in the same universe. You get crossover with characters, um, and Agatha Christie also likes to put in um, little bits that are callbacks to her other books. So people that, for example, Poirot met or um, events that took place in these other books. And so she really created this, this universe in her stories that I like to uh, be aware of. Something else that I've really started to pick up on, especially mostly in the Poirot stories, is the fact that Poirot seems to be a truth seeker rather than a justice seeker. And so I've been looking out for quotes about truth or times when Poirot reveals what he feels about truth in the books. And so I'll be uh, commenting about those kind of things in this review. But first of all, um, let's just talk in general about Death in the Clouds. So this is a Poirot from 1935. And in this story, Poirot is on an airplane traveling from Paris to Croydon. Now, Poirot does not like flying. He talks about being um, upset in the stomach, uh, but I think there, there is an element of that, but I also think that he's just like afraid of flying. And rightly so. I'm not entirely sure that I would, would want to be flying on a plane in 1935. It's still very early in uh, the era of flight. Anyways, so he is on this flight with um, 11, I think 11 other passengers, 12 other passengers, and two uh, crew members who take care of them in their cabin. They are in the rear cabin and there is another cabin, but we don't hear anything about what happens in that cabin. So one great thing about this story is that there is a um, 
a plan of the rear car on the Prometheus, which is the name of the airplane. So you get this plan and you can see who is on the airplane with Poirot. So the cast of characters, the passengers, we have Madame Giselle, James Ryder, Monsieur Armand Dupont, Monsieur Jean Dupont, Daniel Clancy, Poirot, Dr. Bryant, Norman Gale, the Countess of Horbury, Jane Grey, and the Honorable Venetia Kerr, plus two of the flight crew. So, on this flight, it is discovered uh, very close to the end of the flight that Madame Giselle is dead. The flight attendant at first just believes that she is sleeping, um, but as he tries to get her attention, he, he notices that she is dead. So he discreetly tries to find a doctor on the flight and um, one of the passengers is a doctor, Dr. Bryant, and Dr. Bryant goes with this attendant to look at Madame Giselle and he does, he does discover that yes, she is dead. Now Poirot, who is uh, aware of what's going on, has followed behind Dr. Bryant and Poirot discovers on the floor a, um, a little dart that is um, black and yellow. Now, um, her death may have been, um, her death may have been uh, called uh, natural causes, a heart attack or this, the, wa um, the sting of a wasp because a wasp had been flying around the cabin. But with this dart that Poirot um, picks up, they are starting to look for poison. So what's great about this um, plot is it's a closed circle mystery, which I really enjoy. And it uh, happened while Poirot was there. So a murder happened right in front of Poirot's face, essentially, and he didn't see it happen. And apparently none of the other passengers saw it happen as well. So that becomes the, um, the tale is who murdered this woman and how did they manage to do it with nobody noticing. Uh, Inspector Jap makes an appearance in this book and um, all the passengers are brought off the plane. The plane is searched and a blowpipe, you know, one of those weapons where you blow out a dart like that, is found in, tucked down in Poirot's seat. Oh no! <laughs> of course Jap doesn't believe uh, that's true, that uh, Poirot is involved, but it, it is found in Poirot's seat. So, uh, let's get into some of the things uh, that I noticed about this book or, and that I really enjoyed about this story. So, first of all, Poirot books tend to be narrated by someone else. Famously, Hastings narrates a lot of the Poirot books. But in the first chapter of this book, Christy reveals the thoughts of the passengers on the plane, including Poirot's. And so I'm going to be keeping my eye out for that because I think it is one of the few times where we hear Poirot's thoughts. So this book is written in third person omniscient. We get to hear the thoughts and follow um, all the different passengers on, on the plane, as well as some of the detectives, Jap, and uh, there's another one coming up named Fournier. Fournier. Okay, so some of the tropes in this that I totally love, it's a closed circle mystery. That means that there is a, a set number of suspects and the killer is amongst them and nobody else could come in from the outside to, to commit the murder. And I really like that style of um, of mystery story. Uh, I quite enjoy a closed circle. I also enjoy um, mysteries that are set while traveling and so of course this is on an airplane. The murder takes place on an airplane which is very interesting. The victim is Marie Morisot, also known as Madame Giselle and the method of murder like I have already said is poison. Uh, one great thing I noticed, and this of course is uh, because I'm paying attention to this stuff for my Agatha Christie universe um, and also uh, Poirot and being a truth seeker and uh, some of the stories 
uh, etc. But there is a quote here, Mon ami, said Poirot with dignity, when I commit a murder, it will not be with the arrow poison of the South American Indians. So, those of you who are familiar with the Poirot stories, uh, take that for what it is. I think that's very interesting. There is a girl on the airplane named Jane Grey, and I noticed uh, Christy seems to like to name her characters Jane. Um, there is a Jane in The Mystery on the Blue Train, or The Mystery of the Blue Train. Of course, Jane Marple, Miss Marple. And there are probably others. I'll be keeping my eye out for that as well. I just think it's interesting when there seems to be names that, that authors really enjoy. There is, a, of course, an inquest following the death on the airplane. And the jury at the inquest is prevented by the coroner from returning a verdict of murder against Poirot, which is totally awesome. I think that's hilarious. It's probably the only time where Poirot is uh, almost... Uh, declared the murderer at a coroner's inquest. So that's that's very entertaining. Another aspect in the uh, Agatha Christie universe that I noticed in this book is that we we meet Monsieur Fournier of the Cirete in Paris and he met Poirot years ago uh, and so I'm not entirely sure if that is part of, the, of one of the earlier stories, if we'll find out um, but he also mentions that he heard of Poirot from Gerard, and Monsieur Gerard appears in The Murder on the Lynx in 1923, uh, published in 1923. So, Madame Giselle, the victim, she is a moneylender who acquired secret knowledge as a security, essentially blackmail, in order to assure that people paid her back the loans that she gave them, she would acquire secret knowledge on people and threaten to use that if they did not repay their loans. She's described as ruthless, but a woman of her word. Her maid is interviewed, she quotes Madame Giselle as saying, knowledge is security, knowledge is power. Another uh, piece in the uh, Agatha Christie universe, we meet um, Monsieur Giles of the Cirate at one point, and he met Poirot some years previously on a case. And again, that's not, the case is not described, so I'll be keeping my eye out for that to see if that's one from the stories or if that's just um, history of Poirot. But Poirot asks him about Gerard, which is another reference to Murder on the Lakes. A few of the clues that you notice right from the beginning, there is a wasp on the plane, one of the passengers kills it, and the dart that was found by Poirot is black and yellow. Another piece uh, that I find so interesting in the Agatha Christie universe, in Chapter 7, Poirot refers to a case of poisoning in which the killer uses a psychological moment to his advantage. And there, I'm fairly certain that he's referring to the three-act tragedy, which um, was, uh, I think that one was published in 34, so it was like the book before this one. Um, something that I found very interesting and I noticed, and this is, let's talk about Agatha Christie's um, way of presenting the, the clues and developing her plot, because she is quite uh, subtle oftentimes, and she is also great at misinformation and misdirection. She's really good at um, writing things so that the reader misunderstands what's happening or misconstrues a situation or a clue. And so, in chapter 11, we follow Poirot and Fournier in Paris, and the chapter ends with them having a bit of a discussion about Lady Horbury. So chapter 11, um, they end with discussing Lady Horbury. Chapter 12, we follow Lord Horbury. For the first time, we've never heard from him before in the book, so we suddenly are following Lord Horbury, and we learn in that chapter about his fractious relationship with his wife and his attraction to Venetia Kerr. The chapter ends with Venetia passing a man on his way 
to what appears to be on his way to the Horbury house, possibly. She recognizes him as Poirot and wonders what he's doing in the area. So now, the reader is primed to expect chapter 13 to be an exchange between Poirot and either Lady Horbury or Lord Horbury. But instead, in chapter 13, we are following Jane Grey. And then in chapter 14, we are following Norman Gale. So it's almost as if Christie wants to remind the reader that there are plenty of suspects and we need to learn much more about them before we can figure out who the killer is. But when in writing in that way, she is really kind of almost unconsciously drawing the reader's attention to Lady Horbury, kind of focusing you in that direction. In chapter 15, Poirot encounters Norman Gale and Jane, who have been following Clancy. So again, we're getting more information about the other suspects. When, if ever, will we hear about what happened when Poirot visited Horbury? Did he visit Horbury? What was he doing in the area? I have already said that I'm keeping my eye out for information about Poirot as a truth seeker and I found this quote very interesting. Poirot shook his head. There are more important things than finding the murderer and justice is a fine work, but it is sometimes difficult to say exactly what one means by it. In my opinion, the important thing is to clear the innocent. He's having a discussion with Norman Gale and Jane Grey and he asks them what they think is the most important thing and Jane says she thinks that it's finding the murderer and Norman says that he thinks that it's about gaining justice and Poirot reminds them that when you have an unsolved murder you have a number of innocent people who are under suspicion and if that murder is never solved those innocent people will continue to be under suspicion. So I find this interesting um, when, I, when I put it together with the other things about what Poirot believes about truth. And in this case, the truth is important because it clears the innocent. There is a character named Clancy who is a detective writer. He's a pretty funny character. Um, the way that he writes, the way he is described as writing his detective stories. Um, and he is talking to Poirot about his own detective who eats bananas. He likes bananas um, himself. Clancy likes bananas. And so he says, that's what put it into his head to have a detective who likes bananas. So I noticed this again. Oh, this is, this is once more a universe thing. But Ariadne Oliver, who is a, um, a character that shows up later in some of the Poirot novels, she loves apples and she is always eating an apple or talking about an apple pretty much almost every time that she is appears in the stories. And um, Agatha Christie herself in her biography said that, in her autobiography, said that she loves apples. So I thought it was interesting that she writes about a detective uh, a detective, um, Ariadne Oliver is a writer who writes detective fiction, fiction and she likes apples and so I thought this was a little, maybe a little nod to Ariadne Oliver or a nod to um, a, a writer who puts, you know, they like something themselves and so they make a character like that thing as well. In chapter 16 then, we are still with Poirot, Gail and Jane and Poirot asks Gail to send uh, a blackmail letter to Lady Horbury. So now we're back to Lady Horbury. Why is Poirot asking Norman Gale to send a blackmail letter? Um, again, uh, she's causing the reader to wonder what happened in that interview with Lady Horbury. Was there an interview? And if there was, what happened? Um, and then in chapter 19, Lady Horbury receives a card from Poirot, he wants an interview with her, and she says that she doesn't know who that is. So, what was he doing in chapter 12? Did he have an interview with Lady Horbury, and is she now lying about it? If he didn't see Lady Horbury, did he see Lord Horbury? So again, like you, 
uh, I was just picking up on all of these little things and I love how Christy does that, how she causes you to head in a certain direction. One final uh, universe thing. Um, there's a quote towards the end of the story, the three quarters mark. I've questioned the passengers too. Everyone can't be lying. And I think that's Jap who says that. And then Poirot says this, in one case I investigated, everyone was. <laughs> so he is totally referring to murder on the Orient Express. So anyways, um, I really enjoyed this read of uh, Death in the Clouds by Agatha Christie. Um, and I don't, um, I could give a rating, but I mean, those are so subjective and arbitrary. I see, uh, I think, I just, I'm just going to say that uh, this was the first time that I read it and I really enjoyed it. I was totally along for the ride and so far this is one of my favorites of Agatha Christie. It was really well done. It was a good plot, good characters, lots of suspects with lots of motives um, and I didn't guess uh, the ending. Sometimes I can guess the killer, sometimes I can guess the reason why. Uh, sometimes, rarely, I can guess both, and in this case, I didn't guess either. I had an inkling of the killer, but I hadn't like nailed it down, and I certainly didn't know the why. So I can I can totally recommend that you read uh, Death in the Clouds, and if you've never read an Agatha Christie, I don't see why this wouldn't be a great place to start. It is, it is a classic Christie um, uh, with that really highlights some of the things that she's really good at. So give it a read. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Have you read this? Uh, what did you think about it? Does this review make you want to read it? And then before we go, I am going to give you the next My March Mystery Madness Mindbender. Here's the clue. This writer has been named a Grand Master by the Mystery Writers of America and is most famous for his long-running series about a Boston private eye. So put your answers to the Mindbender in the comments below and I will see you again tomorrow for another March Mystery Madness video. Bye!